how do we how do we follow that with a great panel? What an impressive story! Um, I think you know I'll introduce my fellow panelists in a minute. My name is Tim Orchard. I'm the Chief Technology Officer of WithSecure. I think what we want to do now is talk a little bit about this in terms of the context of how much security is enough. You know, clearly there are many lessons to be learned from these two breaches. Clearly there are different strategies in terms of how they were dealt with. I think whether this is a country level impact breach like the ones in Australia or whether this is something that's a lot more close to home, you know, maybe small Finnish manufacturing company who's had some sensitive IPR or data breach. There's always things we can learn from these things and there's some different perspectives that hopefully the panel is going to bring on that. And my job today is really to help help get a good discussion going and, and, and hopefully you guys will learn some useful things to that that you can you can take home to your own customers and help them improve their <coughs> cyber resilience and balance between compliance and security and all of the other business drivers that you've got. So without further ado, maybe starting at the end, my fellow panelists, would you like to introduce yourselves? Hey, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. My name is Robin Oldham, and I'm the CEO and founder of a consultancy, consultancy called Sidea. Um, I've also had the pleasure of helping a, uh, a large UK telco respond with a female CEO respond to a very similar breach. So uh, I can appreciate what you, what you must have gone through in the, uh, in the end of last year. Um, no one's expecting to see me, <laughs> so <laughs> I'm, I'm a late stand-in. Uh, but I work at with Secure with Tim in the CTO office, and um, my role is to try to align some of the emerging technologies we're trying to protect with market need and how that actually translates into what businesses need to do and how they can you know, take uh, regulation or standards into their business, how to interpret it, um, and how that might align with how we then focus our efforts in R&D and the kind of solutions we're trying to build. Thank you. And obviously, Jackie's already introduced herself. So maybe, maybe to kick off, you know, there's clearly a really good opportunity to put a spotlight when there's major cyber breaches on is, is, is anybody's security good enough? I mean, it's a common thing that, that probably every CEO in Australia is saying, how do I make sure this doesn't happen to me? But maybe, Jackie, do you want to kick off? How, 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 how do you continue to keep the right focus on balancing cybersecurity when the heat dies down from a major cyber breach, which it inevitably will, hopefully, at some yeah, point? Yeah, well, approach. it's actually interesting because we've had a, a third breach of a, uh, a back-end credit financer of, of a stack of different uh, retail cards. And just that's, in fact, that was the one that got me, the first two I evaded, but, um, but you know, it's, it's kind of like, oh, yeah, well, we've already had all that data compromised, so it's fine. So it's interesting that it has already started to die down. However, um, what it really highlighted is the lack of legislation and regulation, and obviously I've, I've been looking enviously to Europe for a while over GDPR. Um, we haven't really had anything like that, and we're now starting to look at, at how we do that. And thankfully, um, the process with government has been very consultative, and there's been a lot of engagement with the industry on that process. So that's been good. I think, um, I think one of the things that made a real difference in Australia was to watch you know, the, the journalists, and you should Google it, the journalists were actually really terrible to this telco CEO. And I think every CEO in Australia looked at it and uh, because, you know, she's no slouch, she's a very good CEO and very good with the media. And I think every CEO looked at it and thought, there, but for the grace of God, go me. What do I need to do to make sure that doesn't happen? So um, we have kept the heat on uh, till now. And I think the big heat for us is changing the legislation, getting the right framework uh, in place. It remains to be seen, you know, how we go after that. Clearly, there's a good foundation for good cybersecurity if you've got strong national legislation. But Robin, having worked with you before, I know there's a lot of companies that you've supported in cyber breaches that complied with all of the legislation and still got breached. So how, how, how do you uplift your security from that point in a yeah, sensible I, way? I think there's a really important concept there, which compliance and, and regulation can sometimes be seen as a dirty word. Um, and, and obviously talking about legislation, it seems quite big picture type stuff. But it's really important for all of us as individuals because that's the way that we as individuals get protected within, within our countries from organizations where you're never going to be able to, to affect change or influence them. Um, you know, none of us individually are going to be able to uh, alter the way that Google process our data or not. So it's got a really important role to set that baseline of what we expect. Um, but then bringing it back to an organization, that's where it obviously comes down to risk and what's the risk profile, what's the risk appetite of the, the organization. Um, cyber security 
is important, but it's also only one aspect of what a CEO is going to be trying to, to juggle. Um, you know, there, there will have been other requirements on, on the telco in question, for example, about um, maybe they're trying to roll out a, um, you know, finish their 5G rollout, or they're looking ahead to what they need to do to invest in, in 6G or something. And the CEO's job is to try and balance all of those priorities, right? And the security team need to take good information to the table and say, this is the risk that we face. These are the potential consequences. This, it w this is what it might cost us as an organization. And then the CEO can make those, those calls and trade-offs. That's why they are, that's why they're the chief executive officer, right? Um, and not carry all of that, um, that weight on your shoulders as a security team for having to protect everything all the time, which I think lots of people do. Um, on one hand, we all acknowledge there's no such thing as 100% secure, and then read lots and lots and lots of articles about burnout in the profession and people that are trying to um, you know, undertake these Herculean efforts to, to protect everything all the time. Like, you, we need to reconcile those things. There is a certain level that's going to be enough, um, and that isn't going to be perfect. The bad things are going to happen. Um, and then it's how do you help contain the, the fallout from it? Um, and how do you minimize some of those consequences? Focus a lot on prevention, and we're moving kind of through to over the last kind of as an industry, the last well, five years, a lot more into the detection and the response space. Um, but also, the requirement, for example, of the telco to store this data for seven years. Um, perfectly valid reasons for national security to want to do so. It could have been we want it online for the first 365 days and then archive it, and we want it offline. Mm -hmm. And so rather than having seven years worth of data, you would you really shrink down the kind of exposure that you'd have post-breach, and it would be much easier to contain the, the kind of fallout. It's a really good point. I mean, you know, isn't, isn't cyber risk just a subset of corporate risk or a manifestation mm. of corporate risk? I mean, maybe, Gia, how, 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 how can we better link that conversation between the board, which understands corporate risk very well, and it's quite, quite a mature topic, to getting, getting cyber risk properly understood in terms of that connection? What are, the, what are the kind of key things from the customers that you work with on that? It's, a, it's an interesting question. I think the discussion's been, been going on for a few years on, on how to do that. And I know, Robin, you, you do that all the time. Um, I think one of the things that I've seen that's been interesting and perhaps sort of um, well-intentioned, but actually in the end not been very useful is when, um, for example, the financial services industries that we work with who are very used to regulation and in response to cyber regulation and standards want to do the right thing and want to implement that in their business. But unfortunately, sometimes that becomes a list of things to do and it becomes sort of a, okay, we'll create a team to do that and a team to do that and we need data from here and there and we want you to report all of that data up and then we can give ourselves a tick in the box and say we complied with all of this. Um, but unfortunately, forgetting along the way then, what are we protecting against? And as, as Robin said, sort of becoming a bit more risk-oriented. Um, what is the data telling us? Why do we need the data? Um, and you know, we've seen teams absolutely swamped with um, both tests they need to do to assure their services, but also then how do they interpret in the SOC? Um, what does this mean? Should I be focused on this incident over here or this one over here? Which one's more important? Which one's actually going to get me in trouble? And am I the right person to be dealing with it? You know, so I think it raises a lot of questions. I think it's really important um, from the board's perspective or from the executive level, um, that sort of understanding of what is important and trying to, I guess, correlate all of the activity and energy that they're putting into securing themselves in the right, the right ways, the right sort of sensible practices, and not get too bogged down in the sort of the list of things to do, which is endless. Couldn't agree more. I mean, Jackie, maybe you spend probably a lot of time with boards and execs in your work at Accenture. Do you want to build on that a bit in terms of how we build these better bridges between cyber and corporate risk? Yeah, absolutely. And look, it's, it's one of my favorite topics, so I'll try not to talk about it for too long. But um, certainly, I've been in board presentations where I've had the CEO dictating my report line by line, and I've actually had to go to line to risk and say, you know, you need to tell them what's out of scope really clearly because, and they're like, well, you should say that because, you know, you did an assurance piece of work. And I'm like, well, I will say that, although technically it's not an assurance piece of work, and I'm, apologies if I'm making it overly complex for people, but it's not formally an audit, so we're not kind of sequestered um, from the process. It's a check, say, against a NIST CSF framework. And 
you know, it's really interesting because, you know, I've said to line two, well, you heard that meeting, the CIO is basically telling me to change this word with that word in the report. And certainly I talk to a lot of boards and their perspective is we're in full panic mode. We don't know what questions to ask. We don't know who to talk to to get the right answers. We don't know how to change the structure to, to make sure that people are there. And look, certainly I always say CISOs and CSOs need to come out from under the CIO. I, I don't think it's the right place. I think they need to be under the CRO or, or ideally the COO, or at least with a direct line and a direct independent reporting chain to the board if you want kind of a level of assurance. And we've certainly seen some companies, you know, add cyber risk into line two, so they've got a level of, uh, you know, separation, which I think is, is important as well. But um, certainly, We've created a bit of a state of panic. I think the board directors are panicking. Similarly, um, in Australia, we've had legislation under um, APRA, our financial regulator, CPS 234, which, which dictates cyber risk. And they've written some interesting legislation around uh, really just having materiality for critical assets. And, and quite a lot of clients came back to us and said, well, you know, what's a critical asset? Well, well, I don't know, what are your critical assets? Let's sit down and look through them. And, you know, they've come back with a list of 10 and I'm like, You've only got 5,000 people working at this bank. Like, I don't think you have 10 critical assets. Pick three, that's a good number. So it's been really interesting that APRA or the regulator has devolved materiality down to the company, and that's put them in a flap as well. You know, well, I don't know, how many assets should I pick? How do I look after those? So I think part of it is, is taking, as you discussed in terms of burnout, a lot of the pressure off. And, you know, we obviously do need to have a level of compliance and regulation. But we also do need to say, look, the aim of this is to, to make things better, right? The aim of the CEO talking to the CISO is to get a real understanding of what risks need to be managed. The aim of the regulators is not to tell you what things to measure, it's to get you to work out what you should be measuring and get that up to standard yourself. So I think it'll be really interesting to see that kind of shift in regulation, but also I think within the business, it's up to us to, to counsel and take that approach where um, we can actually say, look, you know, take the pressure off. You know, go and talk to people about what you think the assets are. Make a decision as a group uh, and then work out how you prioritise those and, and protect those rather than, as you say, just investing in all these compliance frameworks. And then talk to the regulator about, you know, why you ha have not necessarily in detail followed this compliance framework so much as look to what your critical assets are under different regulations. So I think it'll be really interesting as regulation evolves. Uh, maybe we should actually get AI to write the regulation. They might <laughs> do a better job. Um, to, to get a bit of a, a better engagement, because I think it's been very rules fines, uh, and we need a new way. What about, what about accountability? I mean, in different, if in different countries, there, particularly at the moment, is a shift in terms of being able to provide proper accountability on different levels. We've got you know, company-level accountability for data breaches is pretty common now around the world. We're seeing things like um, some of the European cybersecurity directives wanting to shift more accountability onto service providers and people like that on, on, on behalf of companies. Maybe there's also, in, in, in your case, because there is a failing of regulation to keep up with what's needed for modern standards, is there a government level of accountability? How, I mean, maybe starting with Robin, how, how would you see the right balance of accountability across those and, and maybe other dimensions in oh, breaches oh, such as there's a There's a question. Um, no pressure. I think, so organizations do need to be responsible, and I think that that applies to suppliers as well. Um, so there are, because the, the, the <laughs> Let me start again. So yeah, organizations need to be responsible because the, um, even when you've got a supply relationship like B2B rather than B, uh, you know, consumer to, to the business, that's still their organizational responsibility. If you're, it, you are responsible for your product or service that you're putting out into the world. Um, and so there should be a requirement for it to be fit for purpose. Um, and you see that with consumer protection legislation and things like that. Um, so yeah, if you're a security vendor who's selling, um, selling boxes and they're not very good, um, then you know, should someone call you out on that? Well, probably. Um, and you'd hope that market dynamics would cause people to go, that's not very good, I'm going to buy that one instead. I'll have the, I'll have the, uh, you know, I'll have the, have the A rather than B. But um, putting that focus on 
on quality is probably where it where it comes down to, I think. Um, and and you can run the risk of ending up with this kind of uh, you know nested accountability, and then they've got accountability. They've sort of they well, yeah, it's all the same thing, right? You're accountable for the service or the product that you provide. I think is where it comes down to. Fair, Julia. Do you want to add to that? Uh, yeah, I think. Um my perspective on that is, is, I guess, the same as yours in that it's about customer trust, really. And if you're thinking about protecting an outcome, I think that's the outcome you're trying to protect. Um, so really, companies need to look at a level of comfort that they have with their supply chain or third-party risk, and it should go down the chain. And you know, we've seen people who are using cloud um, sometimes assuming levels of responsibility are there and they're actually not there when it comes down to it. And, and really sort of thinking through data flows and even more so now with the use of machine learning models, understanding actually where did the model come from? Did we, did we base this on an open source model? Uh, who's accountable there, of course? You know, we've seen open source issues. That's probably another conversation. But I think, yeah, ultimately, it comes down to the person who is engaging with the customer. The customer is putting their trust in them. And that's where the, you know, the sort of liability is, in my view. It's fair. And Jackie, maybe, maybe as, we, as we start to wrap, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of make you go back on this. It's not about AI, and I'm going to ask you an AI question, given it's so hot. I mean, another very big data breach over the last couple of months that's AI-related is obviously Samsung and all of, the, all of the noise that that's created around the world on, on, on employees putting sensitive company data into public large language models. How, how, how are you thinking about at Accenture and talking to your clients about how on earth do we get that part of, of, of data security under control? Do you have any words of wisdom for the audience? Well, it's really interesting, actually, because the, the answer lies in AI again. So yes, of <laughs> course we are. And the answer is, you know, how do we build um, you know, AI systems that stop our staff, you know, enable our staff to use the technology, but also prevent them from releasing sensitive information into large language models that then our competitors can use, as, as we've seen with quite a few um, competitive firms. So, you know, really the only way, um, you know, we've all seen the Terminator, right? And we saw a little, little version here yesterday. The only way to fix the Terminator problem is to send another Terminator. So I think that's, <laughs> that's the game plan at Accenture. Good. Any other last words on this from maybe Robin and Julia before we wrap? I just want to, want to pick up on um, probably the best question that you can take back into your organizations or your customers is, what are you defending? And get everyone to write it down in isolation and compare the notes mm. and see where the gaps are. You'd be amazed how much, over time, um, what's important to a business drifts and diverges between mm. maybe what the board thinks is important and what the security team thinks is important and what IT and what customer ops think are important. Um, you're only going to win and you're only going to have enough security if you're all aligned on the same thing. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, what are you defending is a really important question and a really easy question to ask. Thank you. Julia, any last words? Um, I guess just thinking about you know, data breaches and something that you said before that stuck with me um, around the, you know, the, pre the press reaction to a data breach. And I think sometimes that stops good information sharing in the industry. Mm -hmm. And you know, threat intelligence sharing is really important for everybody to get that step up. Um, so I suppose my point there is around sort of public perception about whether or not you should say, yes, I've, I've been breached. It was OK to be breached. Everyone's breached. We know that. There's no 100% security. So it's more about, I think, sort of handling communication and just information sharing in the industry being super important in that. Thank you. And thank you, panelists. We decided we wouldn't do Q&A because we didn't want to get in the way of lunch. But if anybody wants to follow up any of the points that we raised here, then myself and all of the panelists would be more than happy to talk to you uh, throughout the rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Let's give them a huge round of applause for a very, very interesting panel.